This, the Peterloo Massacre, revealed the extent to which the English authorities were prepared to go to defend a status quo that itself depended upon the support of a Christian establishment. On that day, one of the speakers, a witness to the massacre, was the atheist Richard Carlyle. Carlyle had already come into conflict with the establishment by publishing and distributing Tom Paine's pamphlets. The fact is that Richard Carlyle would be one of an apostolic succession of atheist radicals committed to the interests of the working class who would, over the next hundred years, help to create a new political philosophy. However, the government realized that radicalism and atheism went hand in hand, and they were determined to fight them both. Richard Carlyle was actually imprisoned for publishing an atheistic and politically subversive journal called The Republican. His crime? Blasphemous and seditious libel. His journal carried on under the editorship of his wife, but she was also imprisoned. And then his sister, but she was also imprisoned. Indeed, 150 people were imprisoned for publishing and selling the Republican. And between them, they served a total of 200 years in jail. In fact, one of the Republicans' most distinguished contributors was the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, who had been sent down from Oxford for writing a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism. If he is infinitely good, what reason should we have to fear him? If he is infinitely wise, why should we have doubts concerning our future? If he knows all, why warn him of our needs and fatigue him with our prayers? If he is everywhere, why erect temples to him? Oxford University was unfortunately not prepared to see Shelley's work as a promising philosophical treatise. Perhaps he was born just a fraction too early to be able to attend a university where his opinions might not have been so out of place. He could have gone, as I did, to University College in London. I don't know exactly why I chose to come here to University College Hospital to do my clinical work after I graduated in natural sciences at Cambridge in 1956. I think that one of the reasons was the fact that the medical school was associated with a university on the other side of the road, and that meant that I could follow up some of the things that had interested me as a student at Cambridge. But I was also drawn by the fact that it was a secular institution. In fact, the place was known almost from its foundation as the godless institution of Gower Street. And that was because when this college was established in 1826, it was deliberately created in order to allow students of all religious denominations, and perhaps none, to study and graduate. Until the initiative that founded University College London, it was impossible to enter any British university if you were not a communicating member of the Church of England. This, of course, excluded Catholics, Jews, non-conformists, and, of course, non-believers. What you see in this box are the mortal remains of someone who was perhaps the most memorable person responsible for this philanthropic initiative. It is, of course, the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who on his death strangely insisted that his medical colleagues publicly dissected his body. In fact, although the head of this effigy is just a waxwork now, the original head is kept in deep freeze elsewhere, the founder's bones still exist under the clothes that you can see here. 
Now, the fact that someone other than an executed criminal would voluntarily submit his corpse for public dissection indicates Bentham's sublime indifference to the notion of resurrection, his disbelief in immortality, and his commitment to the utterly material basis of reality. Nevertheless, Bentham did recognize the need for some sort of secular alternative that would guarantee the moral stability of society. And for him, the answer was utilitarianism, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, eloquent though his arguments were, it was difficult to see in it a practical program of social action of the sort that political radicals like Carlyle were looking for. And when philosophical principles were eventually recruited to the service of social reform, they took a much more subversive and revolutionary turn, which would dominate the political agenda of the whole world for the next hundred years. The very idea of a secular, moral philosophy, not to mention a social order based on it, was inevitably in conflict with the Christian establishment. At the same time, Christians were about to be disconcerted by a completely unexpected threat to the foundations of their belief. Although it took some time for the church to reconcile itself to the picture of the universe which Copernicus and Galileo had created. And incidentally, Galileo was not officially apologized to until 1984. But by the end of the 18th century, the spatial layout of the universe was now an established fact. But when it came to chronological considerations, science was about to embarrass Christian dogma once again. Wherever the earth was said to be situated in the universe, the religious belief was that it was created by God as described in Genesis, in six days. And this idea was still at the foundation of Christian and Jewish faith. The fact is that there were academics and theologians who had spent hours calculating what they thought was the precise age of the earth on the basis of the biblical account of it. And as early as 1650, James Usher had come to the startlingly precise conclusion that the Earth was created in 4004 BC, on October the 22nd, in the evening, apparently. Uh, what God had been doing that morning is still open to conjecture. But the rapidly developing science of geology in the hands of men such as Buckland, Hutton, and above all, Charles Lyell, was about to subvert the idea that the Earth was created as recently as theologians had previously maintained. According to the newly emerging version of geological history, the Earth had existed for many millions of years. And this was one of the basic presuppositions upon which Charles Darwin would eventually raise the theory of evolution. There's a strange sense of paradox as you walk around this rather impressive estate and realize that this was the house in which the origin of species was written. Written by a wealthy person from the British upper middle class establishment. Charles Darwin, after all, was a gentleman with unquestionable social pedigree. And yet his book was one which would subvert the foundations, the intellectual foundations upon which a great deal of English social life was based. The point is that Darwin's work would call into question God's role as the creator of nature. 
and that would inevitably undermine the authority of a predominantly Christian, social and political establishment. And what he finally published in 1859 would turn the theological establishment, and to some extent, by the same token, the social establishment on its head. By formulating a theory that explained the origin of species, Darwin was inevitably challenging the idea that God himself was the origin of everything. It was a devastating, and as the American philosopher Daniel Dennett has pointed out, a dangerous idea. At the beginning of your book, you refer to this wonderful uh, schoolboy notion of a universal acid, yeah. which no uh, receptacle can contain. And you make a comparison with that and Darwinian theory. Now, I wonder if you'd like to explain in what respect Darwin's idea was dangerous. Well, I think that we've had an idea, humankind has had an idea for as long as there have been people, uh, and that is uh, it takes a big fancy thing to make a simpler thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith. You never see a pot making a potter. It's always the other way around, big fancy things making simpler things. And then along came Darwin, and he had the audacity to propose a complete inversion of that idea. Uh, that the, the purport of Darwin's theory was, in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. And it was this inversion of reasoning that was so dangerous because it turned everything upside down in a way. It, it suggested that we could have a, a, a bottom-up theory of creative genius rather than a top-down, rather than a trickle-down theory, which depended on an intelligent artificer. The basic idea is so simple that you have variation, that inevitably, if there's variation in the population, some are going to be better than others, and the ones that are better than others are going to have more kids than the ones, uh, than the less favored ones, and the, and the offspring are going to resemble their parents. And most of the skepticism over the century plus that we've had since Darwin proposed this idea uh, has been along the lines of, well, there's just too much work to be done by such a simple process. But the newly discovered billions of years in the Earth's history gave plenty of time for Darwin's slow evolutionary process to work. And believers in God simply had to accept that they might have a problem. Darwin's discovery of natural selection is the first time that a scientific idea subverts one of the principal arguments in favor of God because it dispenses with the idea of design well, his theory has a certain sort of elegance because wherever you observe life, although its efficiency is undoubtedly startling, the developments are sort of gimcrack. They're improvised. They're put together without a, a view to an outcome. In fact, when you come to think of it, <clears throat> the word improvise is rather unfortunate and misleading because it makes it look as if something is blundering its way towards a conclusion, whereas nothing is blundering its way towards anything. There's no mentality at work here. There's no conscious object in view. The process, for example, of getting bits and pieces of the jaw of ancient reptiles into the inner ear of modern mammals, bones which enable them to hear, is not one that took place because something foresaw that those bones might come in handy as a hearing device. Hearing simply emerged as an unintended consequence of the unsolicited variations. In Darwin's time, the material basis of heredity was still obscure, and the origin of the variations or novelties upon which natural selection worked remained utterly mysterious. The biologist Richard Dawkins has written a great length about genetics and has committed much of his academic career to answering the questions that arise from Darwin's theory. 